Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled today to be joined by writer and director Audrey Duan to talk all about her movie Happening. And I wanted to start by talking a little bit about the initial script writing process, because it sounds like you wrote a first draft of this actually very quickly and that your producer saw something there that you could have actually started working with at that point. Um, but you wanted to be able to take a little bit more time to kind of finesse and evolve the script. And so what were the details within the story or the characters that you really wanted to continue spending some time working on at that point? I, I, I don't think it was about the characters. It was more about the general process and how to turn a story into a movie while thinking at the same time at the story and the filmmaking process. So this is where I realized that I wanted it, how I wanted the movie to be a physical experience and how uh, I should carefully think about this way to tell the story while writing it, you know. Mm -hmm. So I had and then the first version that was more, sorry, I had the, the first version was more uh, adapting the story. And the second version was more about the experience. Yeah, that's so fascinating. And then when it came to starting to think about how you wanted to tell the story visually on screen, the camera work is, is so beautiful and there's so many intentional close-ups. And, and I've heard you talk about how you really wanted the audience to feel like the character rather than just a voyeuristic thing where we're watching this journey and we're watching the story unfold. And so how did you set about figuring out how you wanted to place and use the camera to tell the story in that way? Uh, first of all, I, I picked this frame, uh, the, the 1.37 ratio, like almost squared, because I was thinking, okay, it's something that will avoid, help me avoid the period piece. And I really didn't want it to make a period piece because, you know, period piece always comes with some kind of nostalgia. And I have no nostalgia regarding that period, even more when we are talking about women's rights. And so I could concentrate on what was essential to me. So her, the, the woman, her body. Um, and even while reading the book the first time, I had this idea in mind, what if, because I didn't read the book in order to make a movie. Uh, I, I read the book um, because I had an abortion myself and I wanted to, uh, to find a text would help me think about it. And reading the book, I was like, what if I had a cam recorder uh, in the 60s, what if I could actually follow a girl and see what was the exact journey in France before the law, before we were allowed to get legal abortion. So um, this frame comes with that idea. And then I realized that to make it uh, an experience, we should work on many things like, um, like the focus, like the, 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 the Laurent Tangier, the DP is gonna be her, like if they were dancing together, and then the gain charge of the focus is going to focus on what she looks at. So it's being in her sensation, it's looking at what she looks, it's hearing what she's listening to, what she pay attention to. So the sound goes the same way, you know? And then there are the music of the breathing because it's quite a silent movie. And I wanted to, how, how to use this silence in order to keep the tension growing and not be bored, you know? So the, the music of her breathing, like slowly or, or more, more intensely tells you about what's going on in her mind. So it was, it was how to sing the movie in many, many, many dimensions. Mm -hmm. And you were mentioning the music composition there and, and it's, it's so delicately placed. It's not something that takes you out of a scene, but as part of the fabric of it and even just the sound of breathing, um, you know, and the composers that you worked with were the Galperin brothers who, who you were so you know, kind of keyed in on getting for this film in particular. And so what did that post-production sound design and, and music composition stage look like in making sure that it always had that delicacy and again, was just all about connecting you to the character? Uh, okay, with the Galperin's brother was, it was a story because I, I first heard the Loveless score, the Diaginsev's movie, and I was, was amazed by their work because it's not exactly music it is something else you know it's like more ideas uh, written with, uh, out of sounds so I really wanted to work with them and I asked them first and they said that they were sorry but they have no time uh, and so is my editor with Geraldine Mangenot we still edited my, my, my movie with the score of Loveless and then we sent them 
we turned the movie back to the Galperin's brother. And Evgeny Galperin said uh, he was furious because he hated people to edit new movies with the score he did for another movie. But still, he must admit it that it works. So finally, they, they find time to, to work on my movie. And, and so I asked them really to, to write music as they would actually try to write sentences. And that was my work with my actress, with Anna Maria Bartolome. Like when she was silent, we wrote in her monologues words that she would always have in mind and, and that she would be trying to give to the audience, to share with the audience. And, and the music, which is not music, helped us that way. And then the sound goes the same way. You know, it's like focusing on what she focuses when she actually focuses on something in the outside world and then do the opposite when she's in her mind, you know? So it's really a way to, to play with every tools we have to connect with her, even when she's silent. Mm-hmm. And I'm so glad you were bringing up the inner monologues with, with Anna Maria that the two of you would write together because it sounds like it would be, you would kind of write an inner monologue and then she would go through and, and kind of, if there are places where she wanted to rewrite some of it for her performance, that she would do that. Um, and I think there's such a, so many beautiful moments and so many emotions that we get in those moments of silence. And so how did that really help the process alongside having someone who had experience working with a camera and being very comfortable with it being so close up to her in a lot of those moments? Um, it's really, I mean, what I have with Anna Maria, which is so precious, which I, which I treasure is trust from the very beginning. First, we, we settled the meaning before the shooting, like we spent so many hours during the lockdown also, because the, the shooting was a bit postponed because of the lockdown. And we spent so many hours talking to each other, sharing references. And to me, it was like kind of building a common language, you know? So it goes from Rosetta, from the, the Darden's brother, to Fish Tank from Andrea Arnold, to um, Elephant from Gus Vincent, or, or, or Vagabond from Agnès Zarda. And it's very interesting because it, there are, those are filmmakers from all over the world, actually. And then we would pick some details, you know, that would help us find Anna, the, my, my character. And when she arrived on set, we had the same level of knowledge regarding to the character. Like, whereas somehow, you know, you've got the writer or director who spends so much time writing and then thinking and preparing, and then the actors, actress jump, jump in at the very last moment. Here we were really connected before the shooting and we needed to because I don't want to rehearse the key scenes. I think that to do it properly, you have to be brave, you have to be at risk, you have to give it a try. And and if it doesn't work well, you find another solution. So it's really exploration. But in order to do it, you have to find actors that do agree with the, the, the system. You know? mm-hmm. And so we were really on the same page with Anna Maria and, yeah, that helped a lot. <laughs> I also love that even when she came into to the casting process, into the audition room, that she was already asking questions about certain scenes and, and certain moments and, and how you were going to film them. What were some of the initial questions that she started an- asking you even during the casting process? It was, of course, uh, she was wondering about her body and her being naked. I mean, when I first met her, she was 19, so very young. And, and she was asking me about her being naked on screen. And she said, I understand I have to be naked, but I would love to hear from your voice. Why should I do it? And actually, it's a very good and natural question. So she was bold to us, whereas lots of actresses were trying to please me in a way. Uh, she she really wanted to have answer in order to be sure that she would be the right person. So I I, I was thinking she's really involved, you know. And, and to me, it was a proof that she was really involved. And then, you know, when when it was more difficult, for instance, the, the, the abortion sequence, at first I thought that as she was in pain, she should be shouting, which is a very basic idea, and it didn't work. And, and so I sat in front of her and we tried to work as if we were mirrors. So uh, I said, what if we reverse the process and you try to breathe 
as if you were about to faint, as, as if you have a lack of oxygen. So breathe slowly and I do it. And she's doing it at the same time and I can see what she's doing, but she also can see what I'm doing. Until the point that we both feel that we have found the best way to do it. So it's really working in and, and in hand, you know. And, and that scene where she's going through the procedure of the abortion, um, the camera is unrelenting in that moment as well. But I also was so interested in the choice of the camera angle because it's over her shoulder, um, you know, so it's, it's not directly on her face, but we're getting the essence of everything that's going on on her face anyway. How did you land upon the specific choice of how you wanted to film that particular scene? Um, it was the same process for, for, for the whole movie. It's like, if I try not to watch her, but be her, I have to ask my, myself what she would look at, you know? So you're around 20, you're going through that story. There are things you want to see, things you don't want to see. And then things you don't want to see, but you still have a glimpse of it because you can't help it. So it was really, uh, whereas it, it, it would it would feel fair to me regarding to that question. Yeah. And it's good, by the way, because it's not moral anymore. It's not me as a filmmaker trying to give my feelings of the story, you know. It's a genuine interrogation considering what she's going through. One of the other visual aspects that I wanted to ask you about was, was the use of color in the film. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of very natural tones, but also there's certain colors like blue comes up quite a lot. You know, there's moments where she's wearing blue or even just a towel that's being picked up has hues of it. Um, and what are the ways that you wanted to use color to tell a story? It's funny and interesting because these were not the color I picked on set. Mm -hmm. Not that, um, I mean, in a colorful way, in the way you perceive the color very strongly. But, uh, you know, I was working with a, uh, someone that I really like to work with now uh, in charge of the colors. And his name is Yov Moore. And we edited the movie the way I set it in my head, the way we worked on it with, with Laurent Angie, with uh, the DP. And then he said, let me just try something. And then it makes everything go very stronger and brighter. And I was like, oh, you know, you get used to a color, a certain amount of color, and then it's, it's shocking. But he said, Audrey, you said, I want this girl to be alive. I want to see her skin. I want to, to feel as if I could touch her skin. Is the skin more alive? And I, and I watched it and I was like, yeah, you're right, it is. So, I think to me, art and the process of filmmaking is about that. You know, you have ideas and then you go revolution and then you, it's how much you can accept to go a bit further and, and to, to make distance with, with what you first, with your first thoughts in order to find the rightest thing to do, you know. And with a lot of the details like costumes and production design, going back to what you were saying earlier about wanting to tell the story that didn't was, you know, was telling a story of that time, but didn't feel like a period piece. Mm -hmm. um, what did your collaboration with those departments look like in terms of finding the details that you wanted to bring forth on screen, but having things that were reflective of that time period, but also had kind of a real timeliness to them as well? Yeah, it's, it was a very long discussion, but you know, it's, it's, it's costume, it's makeup. I mean, I asked them the worst. I asked them to help me find something where the, nobody's gonna see their work. They work a lot, but in a very essential minimalistic way. And so nobody will actually realize the amount of work they had to do to get there. So it's, re it's really, you have to be smart and, and humble uh, to, to, to do that kind of thing. And, um, and plus regarding, so I wanted everything to be not anachronical, but on the verge, you know? So things that actually, I, I asked them, let's find things that we would wear today. Not the fancy 60s clothes, you know? Let's not go that way. Let's keep in mind that they are from a working class. And actually, Annie Arno, the writer, the first time I came to her house, she said, but do you want to take pictures from my album? And I was like, yeah. So she opened her album from 63 and I take pictures 
And it's not that fancy, you know, it's very simple clothes. It's that what she could afford back then. And, and plus she tells me, you know, by this time when you were a working class student, you, had three, you have three outfits for the whole year. So I said to my costume designer, they should only have three outfits. Let's stick to reality, let's work on reality. And it's also the way we can actually tell the audience, not shouting me that loud, that they come from the working class. So you get a sense of it, you know it, even if unconsciously, you know. You know, and you're, you're talking there about her coming from a working class background in the film as well. And she, it feels like she's kind of stuck in this central space. She's left home and has entered this educational space and she doesn't quite fit in there, but also feels like she's left behind where she's from. And, and how did you want to reflect that space of kind of being between these two worlds for her? Actually, you know, whenever you start writing, you put a lot of yourself. And I think that's one of the dimension of Anyanu's work that I really have in mind for being myself in between two social classes, but more my grandparents and my parents. And I was um, half raised is too much, but I spent a lot of, of time at my grandparents and then a lot of time at my parents and they are not the same social class. So I was always wondering where I come from, where do I feel myself, uh, what, what social class I, be, I belong to, you know? And, and so I, I, I perfectly understand the feeling that, that is being stuck in between, you know, and try to figure out what's your own place in the world and, and that's gonna take time and that's a struggle. And that's actually when you, you work yourself, you know, because your social class is, is your work, is your is the way you earn money yourself, and it's what you do want to do with this money, by the way. And and also in, in the way that you've told this story, one of the things that I, I really appreciated is the fact that we're not watching a character go through a journey of deciding whether she wants to have this procedure or not. There's never a moment where she questions her choices. She always knows exactly what she wants to do and, and has very a very clear set of ambitions in terms of her educational pursuits and, and wanting to make sure that she's able to do that before becoming a mother. Um, and was that something that was always important to you that, that every single part of the script and, and Anna Maria's performance really reflected that? Yes, because, you know, it's, if, I, if I had started earlier considering the story, first it would, have be, it would have been a bit trail to the book and I never intended to do so, but then uh, it could have been a moral purpose, you know, whereas she should or shouldn't do that. And, and I really didn't want to make a moral movie. I mean, I'm not interested. I, I'm bored most of the time when I watch moral movies, you know. And I want, just wanted to share the, the, the most, exact, the most exact, exact way or fairest way the, the, the process she has to go through. As she has decided, she should have an illegal abortion. And also with, with this journey that she's going on as well, it's, it's such an isolating thing because she can't even really fully talk about it with people because that also puts them at risk of legal ramifications. Yeah. Um, and what were the most important moments within the story and this journey for you to reflect that side of just how isolating it is for her as a character to not have anybody that she can even talk to fully about everything? I really... I mean, there are several moments, but when her mo with her mother, when her mother says she's she's gonna fail her exam and she can't say anything because they are actually quite close. I mean, talking about the real people, but the mother is quite progressive, so but she has decided she would have only one kid in order to send that kid to university one day, and they are first generation going to university, so. Anne feels that this would be a betrayal to her mother's expectations and to her sacrifice, and, but also with the friends, because the friends, they would love to help, but they're scared because they are also first generation going to university, and if they end up in jail, in jail then it's done, you know? So there is a lot of social pressure on everybody, and all this social pressure comes from the low. And and, and talking about it, of course, being here in, in America right now, I, I, 
I re relate even more to the story, you know. I was thinking, talking to, 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 to journalists and audiences, I was thinking one thing, like if we have to go through that debate again, beyond the, art, the artistic process, I want to show what is this journey? Because how can we discuss pros and against? How can we discuss abortion not knowing what is illegal abortion? When I read the book, I discovered that I didn't know much about it. Like I have ideas and words in mind, but the, the real thing you go through, I didn't know. And the film does such a great job at, at capturing all of those details, you know, a lot of a lot of those elements like the legal aspects that we were just discussing that were so specific to the time. And it never feels like it's trying to feed you information, you know, even just the scene where she goes to the doctor and he gives her something which he tells will help her, but it's actually strengthening the embryo. You know, that's a real facet of, of the time and still is part of some of the medical system to this day. And so how did you approach the challenge in, in telling a story which brought forth a lot of that information for the audience, but didn't feel like it was too heavy handed in the way that it was giving us that information? I mean, I, I'm the first reader, first, first audience. So I get to discover things while reading the first the time, the book, the first time. So uh, I, I had a strong feeling on how you could actually discover things through the story, but then you go filming them and it's a bit more complicated because you have, we have a lack of representation. So I didn't know exactly what the object she, the, the, the abortion is put in her, in her body, you know. And with a set designer, we had the hardest time finding this, this object. And we had to work with a, with a museum, like medical museum and, and medical university. And I, I, we got help, them helping us in order to find the right gesture, the right objects. It wasn't easy. But as it was not easy, I was thinking it's even more necessary that we are doing it now, right? Absolutely. And, and in, in all of these moments throughout the film, with the way that you allow us to step inside the experience of, of this character in the story, um, there's a lot of long shots and moments where you really allow the camera to hold there. And was that something where on set, when you were filming the scenes, you had a sense of how long you wanted to hold the camera in a moment, or was it more about when you were in the editing room? Because the, the tone and intention of a scene can change so drastically depending on how long you hold on a single yeah. shot for. Of course, but trying to be her for me was feel what she feels, you know, and, and it's a matter of the length of every sequence. Because if I say that she feels pain, uh, and ask Anna Maria to show it to the audience. It takes, it takes two minutes, you know. But if I want us to feel what she feels, then uh, then you you have to keep rolling, you know. And you can't do it editing if you don't have the the right length, then you're done. But also, and I felt it while editing, by the way. If you stay too long, then you become provocative. So it was a matter on set. And of course, I kept a, a clear eye on it while editing. Yeah. And lastly, I mean, you bring such a wealth of experience as a filmmaker, but also as a writer in other mediums. And, you know, you've mentioned just having a path to filmmaking where you've had a lot of different jobs along the way. But I feel like as a filmmaker, all of those experiences, all of those life experiences inform who you become as a director. And so how did you feel that actually working in other spaces and other industries really helped you in the journey of, of making a film like this and informed certain choices that you ended up making creatively? It's funny because um, when I first arrived on set as being a director, I, I really felt at home, but couldn't explain why, you know. It, it all makes sense in my mind, but you know, so I've been a writer, first publisher writer, so I know how to structure a text. I know, no, it's a big word, but I have ideas on how to structure a text. A screenplay, I've been a screenplay writer, but when I wrote for other people, I often made the making of myself. So I spent a lot of time on set watching, uh, watching other people working, but also I saw where the problems can come from, you know, and what are the solution and what is the precise job of everybody on the set, you know. And then I was a, a journalist, so I really used to look carefully at, at reality to be an observer. 
And then I run a magazine and I learned how to make people work together in order to do one magazine every week, you know. And all those experiences, when I analyze that, goes together, you know, they get along. And at the end, yeah, it's all about being a filmmaker, how to observe, how to make, you know, how to make people work together, knowing where the problems are going to come from and finding the solution is basically being the filmmaker. Yeah, I love hearing all of that. And it's it's such a beautifully made film and and congratulations on everything with it. And thank you so much for taking the time to talk about it. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye.